boa van der Eems, and it's quite exciting. We're going to discuss what is currently a bit of a hot topic, but I think that both Boa and Shirley will bring a, um, a settled piece in the discussion. So let me introduce you first, Boa. Boa is a homeschooling dad to five children and um, was the former chairman of the Pestalozzi Trust, is the current chairman of the Cape Home Educators, and is a homeschool activist. And um, Bo is joining us not only as in those capacities, but also as um, an old friend we've known for many years and has just really been a voice for homeschoolers over those years. So, Shills, won't you jump in and let's um, go with the discussion tonight on the complexities of registering with the DBE for homeschooling? Okay, well, everybody always wants to know, must I register? Yeah. And so we do have to tell you that the law says that a learner who's not attending school, which is compulsory, must be registered for home education. But as people who've been involved in the homeschool movement and through the progress of this Bella Bill and now the Bella Act that it's become, we've recognized that there are a lot of problems with the law. And, you know, that's why lawyers have jobs and that's why they are often court cases between parties so we're going to talk through some of these problems and that's where Bo has um, come in he's studied it a lot he's been involved in speaking out mm -hmm. on behalf of homeschoolers so let's start right at the beginning Bo what are some of the problems the first problems that come to mind if you think of the Bella Bill okay I think in summary so the Bella Bill um, now well, puts... Bella Act <laughs> yeah, the Bella Act, yes. <laughs> or the new SA Schools Act with the amendments in it uh, is is now significantly restricting um, the freedom of parents to do what's in the best interest of their children. Mm -hmm. So so the the requirement to register is not new. That's been there from 1996. The terminology is now a bit clearer that it says you must register, where in the past it said you may register, but the intention was always you should register. So let's just stand still on that point for a moment. Is there any constitutional justification for registering? So some people say, yes, it is constitutional because in Article 29 of the Constitution, it says that everybody has got the right to establish private educational institutions. And one of the requirements these institutions must meet is they must be registered with the state. So there's no dispute that private schools have to register. But is a child a school? So, so yet if you say it's constitutional, it, you're treating a child as if it's a, con a, institution. a, a, a educational institution. So, so there, are, but there are problems yet to, if you want to say, um, you must register that it's constitutional. So that's problematic. Uh, the other thing is registration means just putting your name on a register. So we know about registration is if you marry, you register your marriage. Um, if a child is born, you register your child. And then with the registration of the child, it, it, it then says, I am the parent of this child. And that registration puts a relationship between you and the child and places certain obligations on you as a parent. But that registration process is merely providing the information to the state and the state places it on a register. But you as a parent cannot register for home education. You can apply to register. Mm -hmm. And if they agree that 
that home education is good for your child, then the department must register. Okay. So, so if you say, must I register? My answer is you can't register. You can apply to register and, and, uh, and hope the department uh, agrees that it's good for your child and then does that. So mm -hmm. if you apply to be registered, um, the decision whether you're going to homeschool or not is with the state. You just put in your application form and you hope for the best. Now, most parents, when they decide to choose home education, that is not a decision that's taken lightly because now you're taking this whole responsibility to educate your child on yourself and, and that is, uh, it's fearful to many parents. Mm -hmm. So um, it, I think parents will generally agree that it's, it's quite a, uh, a serious decision that they, 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 they're not easily taking. So if, if you've grown up to send your child to a school and you thought this is the way that you get an education and things in the school are so bad that you decide, no, I want to do it myself, it's, 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 a, it's a huge step. For our family, it was a huge step. You can, you can say if it was a huge step for you as well. <laughs> um, and, um, and now an official has got the right to set aside your parental decision. Hmm. So setting aside a decision of a parent about his or her child is a serious thing. So, so in, in other aspects of the child, shelter, medical treatment, um, health, whatever, um, it's only in extreme circumstances that the state will intervene in parental decisions and then set aside a decision and tell the parent, you can't do this, you must do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can, a, a typical example is uh, Jehovah Witnesses that, that do not agree with blood, blood transfusions. Yeah, the state can just willy-nilly say, oh, sorry, we, we're going to ignore your religious convictions. We're going to give your child blood. It's uh, we had, it, it's quite a serious matter that a, a court doesn't easily intervene, and they only intervene in extreme cases. Yeah, but it goes through a court first. That's interesting. Yes, and and comprehensively looking at what's in the best of of the child, not only at education, but you know, the environment at the home, the problems in the school, the health. Yeah, the, yeah, the, they, they've got to take the the total picture into account to decide what's in the best interest of the child only when there's evidence that the the parents are negligent but mm -hmm. but if you if your decision to homeschool is made uh, dependent on the decision of an education official yet suddenly that education official has got vast powers mm -hmm. to uh, set aside your decisions. So I'm not telling you to register or not to, to register. So I'm just saying uh, there, there are quite a number of problems with uh, if, you dis if you say you must register, you must think about those things as well. Yeah, so, so registration becomes a privilege rather than, you know, a parent's responsibility to choose what's in the best interest of the child. It's like, you get, you've got to get a license to be able to, I'm saying license in inverted commas, mm -hmm. to be able to do something that every other parent can do. You know, other parents can decide, I think it's best to send my child to this school, not that school. And nobody makes them pull in an application to get approval for that decision. Yes. Uh, so I think your, your term is actually correct. License is you need permission. So we use registration for things that are usually unproblematic. It's just a mere administrative action. Mm -hmm. You register your car, you bring along the correct documentation, they register it. Um, where license is when other people are affected. So for example, yes, you've got the right to drive, but you are driving on public roads and it affects the, uh, the, the safety of other people. Therefore, you can justify 
that your right to drive a car, your, your freedom of movement is restricted by having a driver's license because it affects other people. So you can, you can justify that you don't register to drive a car, you are licensed to register a car. Or if you want to open a, a pub, you must get a liquor license and the community must be consulted. Do you think that it's in the interest of the community that there's a pub there? And they got to take those things in Conestray to give you permission. So yeah, um, so, so yeah, registration requires permission and, and, and a licensing process is indeed a, is indeed a process of permission. So, okay, that, that does make it clearer. So what we see on social media with a lot of um, homeschooling moms, you know, obviously it exploded after the president signed the, the, the bill, the act. And you have two very clear camps. You have those that you must register within 30 days, otherwise you've got trouble, right? And then you've got the others that are saying, well, we're just going to go under the radar um, because these are our children and we don't need permission to educate them and do what is in the child's best interests. So um, we see a lot of stuff coming out there, people being experts in this and a lot of fear mongering. So I'm really interested in how we can speak to the parent and say, uh, you know, out there, there's so many websites. And I think a lot of the articles have been written by you, Boa, and surely you did that section on our website on the law. But the mom who is sitting at home now every single day with her children, and she's got this big thing looming over her, I have to register in 30 days, um, or I think we're down to 26 now or whatever. Um, what what would you say to that mom, both Shirley and Boa? Um, what your steps? You know, like would you say, you know, register with the Pestalozzi Trust, do this? I would I would love to hear as they're making this decision, as they're doing their research, as they're pondering these big things that you have brought up. What do we say to to that mom sitting in a little house, feeling a little nervous, a little fearful? I'm going to jump in before Boa and just add that I think one of the things that's driving a lot of that fear is that part of the, the act that says that a parent who causes a child not to attend school can be jailed. And so homeschoolers who are educating their children have got this thing, oh, somebody's going to come and knock at my door and, you know, I'm going to be hauled off to jail because my kids aren't in school. So I, I think that's a, a, a thought that sort of, but grows that fear. Mm -hmm. So yes, Boa, how does a home educating parent just stay calm and, and deal with all this hype? <laughs> I just want to address, uh, Wendy, what you say is very important, is what we currently sit, and I've never, well, I have experienced this during COVID, mm -hmm. is we are driven by fear. Yeah. And, and when you make a decision out of fear, those decisions are usually not good decisions. Mm -hmm. Agree. <laughs> um, so, so you must just recognize if, you, if you're making a decision because you're afraid of certain consequences, um, you, must, you must realize you, you're making a decision because of fear. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Okay, and the fear is, I can just willy willy, sorry, willy nilly, yeah. in, in end up in jail. Mm -hmm. So, so I think firstly, that you, you on the one side you fear that the government is going to prosecute you. If you make a decision because you fear that the government is going to prosecute you. You're going to make some decisions to sacrifice some of your rights, yeah. curriculum choice, spend hours on assessments and whatever, mm. spend thousands of rands on assessments. Mm. And that's going to negatively affect your child eventually. Yeah. Uh, so, so you must rationally think yeah. is all these things that I'm doing. So, and you think that by registering, that's going to solve the problem. So we must realize that there are 
um, risks associated with registering and risks associated with not registering. Mm -hmm. So, so if you go under the radar, yes, there's a risk that they can find you and then take certain steps. So we can talk about those steps they can take. But then there are also risks on the other side. If you register, the, you will be required to submit all kinds of assessments and stuff. And what if they don't like your assessment results? What can happen then? Sure. So, um, so let's go to if you do not register, what can the consequences be? And I'm just going to go to, and I've, I've spent a, a, a lot of um, time researching exactly how it should be. So, okay. so, so it's in the Schools Act. It's in Article 3. If somebody does not send your her, his or her child to school, what happens then? Well, it, the law says the education department um, has to investigate the circumstances. Then, and they got to ask you, what are the reasons for not sending your child to school? And you can then say, well, my ch child is being bullied. I don't have money for transport, whatever the problem is. Uh, they then have to rectify that problem. Obviously, if, if it's a valid problem. And then come back to you and say, well, all the reasons why not sending your child to school has now been resolved. Mm -hmm. Now, you must send your child to school. So the um, so before that happens, they let's say you go under the radar. Before that happens, they have to find you. Um, th that is going to be a challenge to start off with, and um, there are ways you can mitigate that. I think one way of mitigating um, is have good relationship with your family and your neighbors. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because uh, we as humans, if we don't like somebody, we'll hit somebody with a stick mm -hmm. and we couldn't care what that stick is about. So just take the sticks away. Yeah. yeah. Good, <laughs> good advice. Good advice. <laughs> um, so that's the first step. They're going to find you. Then they're going to remove, investigate, remove the obstacles. And they're going to say, okay, we've removed the obstacle. Now you must send your child to school. Then they must give you a reasonable time to find appropriate school. If you still refuse, you, you're not sending your child to school. You're not registering for home, home education. Then they must issue a written notice saying, if you do not send your child to school or register for home education within that duration of period, then you can be then you're guilty of an offense. So let's say that happens. You you got the letter. It says you must you must comply with the law within 30 days. And now that 30 days has expired. Then they must come back and 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 see, oh, this guy is now guilty of an offense. Then they must charge you. That, so this is a criminal thing. They must go to the police. They must charge you of uh, being guilty of an offense of uh, yet uh, in terms of this is a schools act then the the police station will open a case and uh, an investigator must be appointed to investigate um, the case and and compile a docket so as far as i can remember um during the feedback session of our neighborhood watch I think uh, uh, an investigator generally sits with about 300 cases simultaneously, theft and murders and whatever. Uh, so you, your case will be one of them. And he must now compile the docket and get all the evidence that you are intentionally not uh, yet complying with the SA Schools Act. Then when he's compiled that docket, he, he takes that docket to the national prosecutor. And the pro prosecutor must then evaluate this and decide whether he, he will prosecute or not. Um, and only when the prosecutor decides to prosecute, will you then subpoena 
to, to appear in court. So it is not a question that an official comes to your house and you are, are yet are what? Hold off to jail. To court. No, 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 to court. <laughs> oh, to court. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a long process to get yeah. into court. And, and, and uh, yeah, so that is the process before you get into court. And now we come to, let's say you are in court. Let's say you are a real, Fighter. you are, you just don't want to register. You are intentionally want to break the law. You don't register. I, and and uh, you, you're not going to fill in that paper. Then um, the judge must find an appropriate sentence. Now the, 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 the essay schools access, well, you can get a jail sentence to up to one year. But even the Department of Education, in their feedback to Parliament, says jail is not an appropriate sentence for a mere administrative negligence. That's what it is. It is mere administrative negligence if you don't register because you haven't filled in the application form yet. Um, but you are educating your child. You've got to yeah. show that, I suppose. So, so, show so, that. So, so the judge must say, oh, well, I'm going to send you parents to jail because they they refuse to, to submit an application form, but the, their children are getting a good education. What, what are you achieving with that? So mm -hmm. I think any rational judge will um, uh, um, – Will not easily make a, a yet yeah. decision, but but the most probable probable sentence is that the court will instruct you fill in the registration form, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and and then it, you must decide: do you want to go to jail just for not filling in a form? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, yeah. This is, this or get a huge fine, maybe. Yeah, so this is a hypothetical, you know, scenario yes. played out, which is great because it 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 does make you realize it's not that somebody's going to come in with battering rams and bash down your door and you're going to be hauled off you know it just doesn't work yeah so, so this hypothetical scenario that you've played out for us is very helpful you know, nobody's going to just walk into your house and take you or your children away um boa in all the years that you have been involved in homeschooling homeschooling your own children in advisory capacities with the pestalozzi have you ever seen parents be taken to jail for homeschooling their children. Can you remember Kader Asmo? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Only homeschooling is, homeschooling is for nomads and gypsies. I remember was his famous. <laughs> so, so, so it, 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 um, yeah, it shows, shows my age at least. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember the comment. <laughs> so, so, um, I think uh, shortly after issuing the homeschooling policy of 1999, Kader Asmal wanted to make an example. And in true yet political fashion, he chose a very vulnerable uh, old lady. Um, Mankeys, I forgot her name. Ma no, not Mankeys. That was bef that was in the days of apartheid. Um, I forgot the name. Mm -hmm. She lived in Pretoria, and they came there with. Um, with police vans and 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 media, and 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 they charging her. She's her, educating her children. She's not registered. And then uh, the Pestalozzi Trust got a an attorney on the line. They talked to the police officer, and then charges were laid. And it and until now, um, uh, the the charges are still with the prosecutor. The prosecutor has not decided to prosecute. And uh, that lady probably is probably no longer homeschooling age anyway. So no, no, that yeah, <laughs> she has passed away in the meantime. Dodi Dodi Kleinons was her name. So that was so so that was a a a a, a it attempt to um to to instill fear in the people and it failed. So that's the only incident I know. Now. It, with the um, submission of the policy, the Pestalozzi Trust submitted um, a par jarquis promotion of Administrative Justice Act, and we required all information around how they compiled the policy, and we went through that. And there were a few uh, draft copies of the discussion document. You can remember the draft discussion document, 
And in one of those documents, um, Trevor Coombe mentioned that as far as he knew, nobody's ever been prosecuted in terms of the SA Schools Act. So I'm not talking about homeschoolers. I'm not talking about all parents that, that are not sending their child to school. Interesting. So, so and it, it, it again shows that the, 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 even in the days of Kader Asmal, the, 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 the education department didn't have the capacity or, or the will to prosecute. So mm -hmm. they, 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 they're trying to make an example one to create fear so that you voluntarily comply with the, your the conditions. So Shirley, you said a couple of times um, children are receiving an education parents are educating, et cetera. That's for me an important point for us to say is that parents who choose not to register, it's not because they don't want to educate their children. They just want to do that within freedom um, and not having to spend hours doing assessments and paying the big bucks for, for those assessments to be done. The important thing is that we need to make sure that we are, as homeschooling parents, diligently doing um, our task with our children. And that can be across the spectrum of homeschooling, but we must be diligent in it. Um, is it true that the requirement is still that the children who are being home educated must, uh, the, the work that they are doing must exceed the minimum standard of the local school is that still stated as part of the home education law um either of you are welcome to answer that well it's uh, the last time i checked it said it must the topics and skills must be comparable to the national curriculum i think that's correct hey Boa? yes it's a very good question wendy so so in the old schools act it says the education must be of a standard not inferior to the standard of education so so standard is something different than content and skills okay the new schools act says the your the you the curriculum you choose must the this the skills and contents of the curriculum must be comparable to the national curriculum statement. So it's about contents and skills and standard is not mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, so the focus has changed from standards to contents and skills. Okay. So it's about, it has changed from a standard of education to prescribing contents and skill. They want your children to learn exactly the set of facts that that other children are learning. Okay. Okay. And I've got a problem with that word comparable to, because who decides what is comparable to and not equal to or identical to? You know, comparable to is open to somebody's opinion, if you ask me. And I think that's going to cause one official in one province to say, yes, that program is comparable to, and another official could say, oh, no, it doesn't match. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to cause a lot of hassles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another problem with um, yet if you register, uh, you must then sign that you will meet the registration um, conditions. Um, if you are required to comply with the law, that law must be clear, and it must be objectively clear. Yeah. So um, if you drive in your car, and there's a sign saying. 60. You can just inspect your speedometer mm -hmm. to know whether you comply to the law or not. But let's say the, the sign on the road says you, <laughs> you must drive at a speed that's comparable to a safe speed. Mm -hmm. how, how, <laughs> how, how are you going to know? <laughs> that would be a bad law. Yeah, it would be. Yes. <laughs> yes so. Interpretation. Yeah, uh, and then law that's difficult to enforce. So, so one of the ways, um, what one can do, you've got the right to clarity. Mm -hmm. So, you and the Pestalozzi Trust did advise parents to do that at some stage. You write a letter. You're saying, please explain to me, yet, how, what method do I use to compare? Yet, I'm using the Mickey Mouse curriculum, and I want to compare it to the national curriculum standard, please um, 
that where's the software program I can use to scan in the two curriculums and it will give me a score and say it's comparable. Mm -hmm. and, and then you wait for an answer and it, and then an you answer. wait. So so, <laughs> so we submitted in, in we lived in Gauteng at that stage. We wrote a letter to the Gauteng Department of Education, say so please give us the standard of education that we is compliant to. And we're still waiting. And once we get that letter, we'll we'll register. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, I've got another question here. So these are just ones that I've picked up off social media or have come through DMs on Instagram. And the the one mom asked, how do I respond to family and friends who are choosing to register? So we're talking about homeschooling families. My sister is now homeschooling and she's registering and she's using PAPS. And I'm choosing not to. So obviously this is now going into that relational state place that you do want to not get each other's backs up. Um, but homeschooling just by its nature seem, seems to do that. You know, it's like um, one of those topics. So how, how, how do we graciously answer those kind of situations? Would surely maybe you want to jump in? Would you say something like, um, I'm glad that you found um confidence in registering we are not in that space right now we are still considering our options do you think that that's a, a good answer would you throw the the verse and chapter at them what would you do i, I think that would bring temporary relief but in a month's time they're going to come back and ask the question again mm -hmm. so whichever choice you have made i think to um sort of just allay that topic i would just say something like Look, we are all parents and we all have to do what we believe is in the best interest of our child. Mm -hmm. I respect your decision to register or not to register, mm -hmm. but we've decided to register or not to register. And we ask you to respect our choice too. And we don't have to debate it. And then, so you're kind of just setting a boundary. Yeah. It's not open for discussion anymore. We've made different decisions mm -hmm. and just leave it at that. That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember you mustn't just you you cannot just ignore the uh, registration obligation. You must you must do it for a reason. So if you use an, a curriculum that is caps compliant to the T and 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 gives you reports on all the caps subjects, then you're not really sacrificing any rights when you register. You, you're doing what they want you to do anyway. So for, for those people, it, it, it can make them feel much more comfortable that uh, if they register, because they, they're complying with the registration conditions yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. But what about when they decide in two years' time that this curriculum no longer suits their child, it's causing them too much stress, and they want to break away from that curriculum program and make their own choice and choose something different, which... In 20 years of homeschooling, we know it happens a lot. New homeschoolers start out doing what the school system is doing at home. And then they realize, but this isn't great. There must be a better way. And then they try and find another way to home educate. Then yeah, I th yeah, I think it, if you registered and you will then be required to submit um, reports every year. And now you're doing some curriculum that's totally different and you will find it increasingly difficult to to complete that report. Um, yet maybe there's no competent assessor for your curriculum. So what are you going to do now? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and That's then you just, you do. <laughs> yeah, and then you fill in whatever you want to fill in and see what happens. Yet mm -hmm. I think the, the education departments are so overwhelmed that they don't even look at those marks. Mm -hmm. But that brings another problem. They expect you to submit uh, assessment reports from competent assessors. So that costs you money, it costs you time. Now you submit those reports. But they just file it, they do nothing with it. Then you must spend a lot of time and effort in, in, in getting those reports, but they do nothing with it. That means there's a, it's, a, it's a senseless effort without any purpose mm -hmm. it's just so that, um so so when the government requires you to do something but it must have a purpose sure. so so the 
<laughs> idea is, and if you listen to the minister, they will say, no, no, we want to have oversight to ensure that all children are getting a good education. Therefore, we want you to send us our assessment results. So that implicates that you send in your assessment report, they look at it and say, oh, there's a problem with the, with the English here. Um, and then they must take some remedial actions. They must pick up that there's problems from the report and take remedial actions. If they don't do that, what is the use of uh, sending in reports? Yeah. Um, Yeah, so I remember, actually, sorry, do you go ahead? I remember Leander saying any restriction on on a person's freedom must be reasonable and justifiable. So let's go back to the speed limit example. If the traffic department sets the speed limit at 60 in a certain zone, that limitation on my freedom to drive 100 is there for the protection of other people or because of a hazard on the road or sharp turns or whatever. There's It's reasonable and it's justifiable. If they're restricting my freedom to educate my child the way I think is best, they must have a reasonable and justifiable explanation for that restriction, mm -hmm. which as Boa showed, it's not really reasonable. I just want to Yeah, so they they claim they make a broad statement. We are it's our responsibility to oversee the home educators. Therefore it's reasonable and justifiable to limit their rights. So they they limit your, your rights in terms of curriculum choice. They limit your rights in where you can educate your children. So there, there are a number of uh, rights they limit. Mm -hmm. And and but nowhere could I see that justification. Mm -hmm. It's not in the it's not in the preamble of the bill. It's not in the CR report saying, well, uh, there's a big problem here and, and we are now fixing this big problem by putting in these measures. So there is no causal relationship between the conditions in the Schools Act and and, and what they want to achieve. Well. What they want to achieve is not clear. We've asked the question over and over again. So so we sat in a meeting, uh, Cape Home Educators, with Debbie Schaefer when the um, policy was approved. And I asked the question to, to Debbie Schaefer is, what are you trying to achieve with this policy? And she couldn't answer the question. And then she looked at the actual drafter of that policy. <laughs> which is advocate Lynn Coleridge Zills, and she can, couldn't answer the question either. She just waffled something about the best interest of the ch child. So there's no clear, there's no clear reason or they haven't got a stated intention of, of, of what this thing is about. Because if they say, we want to achieve this, then we can say, but wait a minute, there may be other ways to achieve the same thing. Then we can have a reasonable discussion. But it's not possible. There's two things that I just want to highlight in what you've said. Um, so the first thing is, you know, this assessment and perhaps the child, the department sees there's a problem with the child's English mark. You know, that's probably not going to happen. They, they, they've got their hands full just with the schools on their own. But I had a question this week from a mom who is now registering and is concerned because her son's reading is about a grade behind the peers that he has in school. You know, he wouldn't be behind if he wasn't being measured by an arbitrary standard. He would be um, developing at his own rate and um, and just by example, for parents who are listening, I think it's always good when we have a cameo from our own lives is that one of my children only learned to read fluently at 12. Did that mean that the rest of his learning was being hampered? Not at all. Um, can he read now as a 28-year-old man? Absolutely. Um, he's running departments, um, you know, got many staff members under him. He's researchers all day 
Um, so the fact is, is that when we measure our children to these standards, we immediately start to put pressure on ourselves and on our children, which isn't in, my second point, their best interest. What is in their best interest is that they are given a growing, thriving, living environment in which to develop their strengths, for you as a parent to bring their weakness up to an acceptable, livable standard and not, you know, and to allow them to excel. So if we can just briefly touch, I think in closing, so that this doesn't get too long, but let's briefly touch from both of you on the best interests of the child. Surely you often say that is the highest law of the land. So can we chat a little bit around that? And then maybe we'll quickly summarize and, and, um, and end the chat. So go for it, Shills. Yeah, I think that thing is that as a homeschooling mom, if you're worried, you, you must always look, is my child making progress? Because to me, that is the goal. And if they're not, then you recognize there's a problem here and you will get remedial therapy or expert opinion or you, then you take it beyond your own home. And you are competent to know what's in the best interest of your child for education, just like you would make the same decision if you see your child is, is sick you know, you can go to the pharmacy and get them something and you see that's not working. Then you go to your healthcare professional and you get some, you know, additional medical care or whatever your child needs. That's what parents do to ensure the best interests of their child. And they know that individual. And the, as you said, let's just say it clearly, the highest law of the land, which is the constitution, says that the child's best interest must always be the priority in every decision pertaining to that child and so that's decisions made by parents made by a doctor even made by the judge who wants to prosecute or who's been told to prosecute the parents he has to do what's in the best interest of that child and that's the highest law of the land so you need to obey that law and not sacrifice the best interest of your child out of fear one way or the other way would you like to add to that, though? Yes. Um, yeah, I think Leonard always said um, education is individualized, and a child is, he develops different aspects of his personality at different paces. So if you've got the standard of you, you, you develop, you are measuring these subjects, and and you expect all that to perform equally in all subjects. It's it's a it's a um, arbitrary standard. But I think this problem is going to explode in the next years. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the and this is not nothing to do with school. Our entire education system mm -hmm. is about memorizing facts and regurgitating them, yeah. and then you get a mark. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Now with artificial intelligence, a machine can do that better than a human being. <laughs> so, so artificial intelligence is already on the level of what they call a smart home, uh, <laughs> a smart <laughs> uh, matriculant. Um, yeah, yeah, a smart school leaver or something like that. I can't remember the right, the right term. So if you send, if you connect, if you take an artificial intelligent bot, and you, you um, make him write in a, a matric exam, he will do exceptionally well. So that's where artificial intelligence already is. Mm. That means a mat anybody with a matric qualification can be replaced by a computer. <laughs> and it, so it means a matric qualification is going to become worthless. All the contents and skills we learn by getting a matric are worthless. We must start thinking of new skills that differentiate us from computers and robots. Excellent point. And so, so I think we're going into a the, all these problems we've got with the with the law and with the curriculum and all is going to explode in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 that's a new debate. I think we can have a separate yeah, conversation yeah, I, I on that. that. Stage. <laughs> it's taking our conversation and going like, "Whoa, yes, oh. you know." But it's 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 a fascinating point. I mean, we often discuss AI and um, like where is it going and that sort of thing. So yeah, it is it is a, a point at note. But just so a quick story in closing. At dinner the other night, we were talking about 
um, the periodic table and new elements that have been discovered. And we, I couldn't remember how many there were when we were at school, we had to memorize it. And my kids looked at me like, what did you memorize that stuff for? Yeah. So I said, well, we couldn't just pull out our phone and look it up like you're doing right now. So we were taught to memorize these things and they yeah. were just like, what a waste you're of energy. You know? Yeah, you're blown away. So let, yeah, let's... we we had uh, I uh, you you probably a bit younger and you you didn't work with the logbooks so but you you grew up an age that why do you need to learn the tables you've got a calculator that, uh, that... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in fact yeah that's actually to 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 um, just add my little cameo my dad who's now eighty six and um, he sits across the table from us if we go out to the restaurant upside down he will add up that till slip faster mm. than he can work out the tip. Yeah. And, and just shows you the brain, the power of the brain. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let's summarize. We've got um, two camps. We've got, you must register. I'm going to consider what my options are and what I'm actually applying to register. That was our first point. We apply to register for home education. Um, we also then chatted a little bit about the problems with the vagaries in the law that people need to get their heads around. Um, and then we spoke about the best interests of the children um, and how people are not just going to bang on your door and take you away. There is a, a process that needs to be followed. Um, we, I know that parents want us to say, register, you must register. And you'll probably find that a lot of people trot out and register. And there are others that want us to say to them, don't register, you know, no, don't register. So people are looking for definites, but it doesn't seem that it's wise um, or actually a decision that surely me or Boa can say what you must do. This is a, something that each individual family needs to figure out for themselves. But I think the general information is make sure that you belong to the Pestalozzi Trust. Make sure that you subscribe to the correct newsletters, right, to get updates and information, whether it's the CHE, Learning Freedom, there's a couple of other ones, surely maybe we can drop the links below in the comment box. And then I think the most important thing is what you said right up front, Bo, is don't make decisions based on fear. Um, so that's the summary from me. Would you like to say anything in closing, Shirley and Bo? Well, I think that was a, a great sum up. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Did I cover it? No, all? I couldn't. I can only say, I think uh, my wife reminded me that Leonard always said, if if you do, you must focus on doing what's the best for your child. That's the most important thing. If if you can always show that what you do is in the best interest of the child, you can you can you can teach with confidence. Yeah, and you can stand before a multitude of accusers. You know, if you know that your children are being held up and um, their interests best. Well, look, it's fantastic. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Um, we are also very grateful that you um, are now the chairman of CHE. We know that you're one of those men that stand on the wall for homeschooling families so that the moms and dads can sleep well at night. So we really, really appreciate that. Thanks for joining us.